silent, turn off alarms, better yet, turn it off. Once the contest begun, the Sergeant of Arms will <coughs> secure the doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it's determined that all ballots have been collected. Please check to see if any devices, again, are turned off. And please, also, please do not text while speeches are going, just to respect our wonderful speakers. Everybody has a program. I'll give the speaking order right now for the national speech contest. First contestant, Bob Sim. First contestant, Bob Sim. Second contestant, Jerry Evans. Second contestant, Jerry Evans. Third contestant, John Labby. Third contestant, John Labby. Fourth contestant, Gina Coates. Fourth contestant, Gina Coates. Fifth contestant, Gary Chris. Fifth contestant, Gary Chris. Sixth contestant, Henry Yang. Sixth contestant, Henry Yang. We will now proceed with our international speech contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me with the green light, then one minute's up. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will give, give all the times needed to complete their ballots. We will now begin our international speech contest. Up and down, 
I continued doing this for almost an hour. I expected him to come out at any time and show himself. He didn't. Must have been gone. Now this is starting to get really serious. So I went into the front room and I started thinking, what could have happened to him? And then this terrible thought hit me. What happens if he escaped from my wife left for work this morning? Got outside. It's cold out there, and he's a house pet. He may not survive. So I do did what I normally do in these situations. I called my wife. <laughs> <laughs> did you see Buster this morning? Neither have I. I've been looking for him for an hour. I think he got out when you left this morning. She concurred that was a possibility that he might be lost. I continued my daily jobs. I work at home. Hours went by. Nowhere to be found. Later that afternoon, I went into the front room and I sat down and I started to think. I had this lonely, empty feeling inside of me. I was so used to him being with me. You see, I am semi-retired and my wife works full time. So I am alone at home a lot of the time. The buster is, what is my constant companion? In over eight hours, that's it. He's gone. I gotta reconcile myself to the fact that he just might not be coming back again. I walked to the window and I looked out on a cold, overcast winter day. Buster, why did you have to leave? It's cold out there. I'm afraid you're gonna freeze to death. And what about winter? And I now know how much I care and love you. Buster, please come home. My wife came home a little while later from work. And she's crying. She walks up to me and says, Is Buster gone? I said, I think so. What are we going to do? I don't know. Why don't you take the flashlight and look one more time? Maybe I missed it. So she's going around the top floor looking for Buster. Then she goes into the basement. I go back into the front room. And I know she is not going to find him. I found him! I found him! I go, what? Where? And I go running down the stairs. And she's pointing. And it's right behind the hot water heater. Where is the warmest place in the house? That cat's not gone. I pick up that cat and I am just petting him. My wife comes out, she's petting him. And I'm just so happy that that cat is warm, home, and fine. My wife gives me a hug and Buster's in between us. He do not know what's going on. <laughs> and my wife and I looked at each other for a moment. And we broke down and cried. If you're anything like me, I let and lose track of people who I love. Oh, I have my reasons. I'm busy. Always tomorrow. Almost losing Buster showed me how much I need to <coughs> renew our relationships again. This experience can show us how much we take for granted our loved ones. Knowing this, we can appreciate them more and get closer. How about you? Who have you let fall to the wayside? Is it time to reconnect? We now know that when we lose our loved ones, is when we find out how much we love them. And in my case, when you find a loved one, yes, 
my attitude was positive, my goals were set, and even my dreams that I had put to start my business, those were intact. But I still felt that there was a little piece of that personal development puzzle that was missing. I wandered without purpose for a long time. I didn't even think about purpose. You know that expression, the teacher comes when the student is ready? See, the true teacher cannot teach us anything. They can only remind us of what, on some level, you already know, but have forgotten. Using the keys you already have, but may have forgotten about or misplaced. The teacher, in my case, he appeared in the form of the transition man, a professional speaker friend of mine, Johnny Campbell. He was the after-dinner keynote speaker at a conference several years ago. About halfway through the presentation, he asked the audience a question. He said, would anyone like to know what your purpose is? He said, just like Dr. Phil, I'm going to cure you in less than 12 minutes. <laughs> Everyone laughed and waited for the answer. He said, your purpose is to serve others using your gifts and talents. That's when it hit me like a lightning bolt as I realized I had been searching for the secrets of success and happiness all those years, listening to all these speakers, listening to audio tapes, going to seminars and workshops, and yet Johnny distilled it down into three simple words, to serve others, using your gifts, talents, passion, and creativity to serve a purpose bigger than ourselves. See, that night, I found my real purpose and my mission, which is just to share my story of experience, strength, and hope, to inspire and to empower and impact the lives of others, helping them on their path of personal development, and mentoring people who are just at the beginning of the path, and giving back and paying it forward. That is my purpose. So ladies and gentlemen, no one, and I mean no one, no expert, teacher, healer, doctor, not me, your parents, our closest loved ones, have all the answers for you. But the answers are there. And somebody does know, unequivocally, and without exception, that someone is you. You're the one you've been waiting for. Try learning from a guru instead. Like yourself. Just you. Guru, spell, spell it with me. G U R U. Or is it G? You are you. We've got a contest with us.
Contestant number three, John Labby. Take the first step. Take the first step, John Labby. You know that feeling you get every morning? You're going to challenge the world and nothing will get in your way? Me neither. <laughs> Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, it's a chilly fall night, September 2009. I'm sitting at my desk. In front of me is the speech I'm to give at next morning's meeting. I've given so many before, but this night, my hands are shaking. My throat is dry. I can't force myself to practice. <coughs> and I give up. I email the Toastmaster. I won't be able to make it tomorrow. I'm really sorry. You see, I'm sick. I wasn't sick. I was just afraid to face the audience. And they would have been friendly. They had to be. I was called president. <laughs> <laughs> I've fallen into a crisis of confidence. No matter what I faced, I knew I would fail. Some days, it was so bad, it took all my energy and drive just to empty the dishwasher. Months later, no change. Can barely work. My marriage is beginning to hurt. It seems as if my whole life is crumbling from that crippling lack of confidence. And but for one email that arrived in the spring of 2010, I don't know how low I would have sunk. That email invited me to join a brand new advanced Toastmasters Club. Of course, I almost deleted it. I mean, surely they wanted dynamic speakers, not me. I told my wife Karen about that email and about my fear. She said, look. Actually, she didn't say it quite that violently. She said, look. <laughs> you can do it. I know it looks hard, but you can only take one step at a time. So take the first step. The next one will be easier. Okay, step one, I went to their meeting. <laughs> you know how it is at Toastmasters, right? You get introduced. <laughs> you do it, say, a table topic. <laughs> we fall off the podium, people. <laughs> it's really hard to stay down at Toastmasters. <laughs> Joining that club was so much easier than I had thought. And soon I took the next step, competed in a contest. Then another step, mentored a new member. And then a bigger step, I became an area governor. For the first time in years, I was enjoying taking a challenge. Yet in the back of my mind, I kind of knew I was only using skills I already had. <coughs> Could I face the unknown? It's another chilly night, January of 2012 now. I'm at my desk, and in front of me is the application to run for Toastmasters Division Governor. Oh, I want the job. I'm just not sure I can do it. You see, I don't know that I have all the skills. I've never run for election, and I've never led a team. <coughs> my throat was dry. But wine will do that to you. You see, that night, 
Karen and I had shared a bottle of dinner. We celebrated our growing happiness together and my improving future. She toasted me words of praise and pride in how much I had grown since I took that first step two years earlier. Sure, running for and serving as division governor would be a big challenge. But that was okay, because we both knew that I could take that first step. How about you? I'm sure you all have high hopes. I'm sure you all have great goals. I'm sure you all have demanding dreams. Might something be standing in your way? Perhaps a lack of confidence or fear? Does the hill before you seem too high to climb? All you need to break free is to take that first step. And when you take that first step, the next one will be <coughs> When you take that first step, you will begin to realize your hopes. When you take that first step, you will begin to reach your goals. And when you take that first step, you will begin to redeem those dreams. Now, what are you going to do? When your hopes feel too high. Come on, now say it with me. Take the first step. And what are you going to do? When your goals feel just too great? Take the first step. And what are you all going to do? When those dreams feel too demanding? Take the first step. Just take the first step. Contestant number five, Gary Chris. Thank God for Toastmasters. Contestant number five, Gary Chris. Thank God for Toastmasters.
fellow Toastmasters. Distinguished panel test chair. Not to guess. I admit, I'm one weird dude. <laughs> I call myself weird because I truly believe this poor farm boy can change the world. For instance, in 1989, I had this idea that I could help solve the homeless problem. I invented a way to take old tires and fill houses for the poor. And it worked. In 2002, I had these weird ideas that I could help Illinois. So I ran for governor. Now that didn't work. <laughs> the reason that didn't work is because I was terrified at giving speeches. Thankfully, my friend from Habitat for Humanity, Margaret, insisted that I join Toastmasters. Needless to say, I did not become your governor. But better yet, I became a Toastmaster. <laughs> but why am I standing here thanking God for Toastmasters? I'll be happy to tell you. Since joining Fox Valley, I've had the great experience of making a dozen missions trips to one of the poorest countries on earth, Cambodia. The pastor of my church invited me there to dig septic systems and orphanages. I'll never forget my first three days, though. The poverty was so horrible. The dusty, broken roads were far, far worse than anything I've ever experienced. <coughs> and not one piece of equipment doing any kind of repair. And worse than that were the multitudes of amputated beggars that would be desperately lifting their hands when they'd see a white-skinned person. And that's just the beginning. Please understand that Cambodia used to be a very advanced and prosperous nation, even considered to be the pearl of Southeast Asia. What brought Cambodia to ruin can be described in one word. Insanity. Forty years ago, a very wicked dictator named Pol Pot took control. His idea was to enslave the people to grow rice. He could then trade this rice for weapons in order to maintain control. Pol Pot ordered that all of the political and religious leaders, all the teachers and administrators, be arrested and killed. Maybe you've heard of the killing fields. Pol Pot stole the bright hope and future of Cambodia and replaced it with a nightmare. A nightmare consisting of millions upon millions upon millions of landmines that are still in the ground to this day. On my fifth trip to Cambodia, I just arrived and I was standing on a corner. And I observed this horribly scarred man drive by on a cart that he would repel with his hands because he had no legs. He stopped his cart and with a cheerful, booming voice he cried out to the public, Welcome to Cambodia! Welcome! And my heart just sank. My heart sank because these rich tourists with their big cameras were just turn their back as they pass the smiling gentleman. One thing my father ingrained in my character is this. When someone greets you, you look them square in the eye. Offer them a firm handshake. Show them respect. Doing what I felt my father would have done, I crossed the street and gave him a big handshake. And after a few words, I said, hey man, let's go get something to eat. And after a prayer and a bowl of soup, this man, Savanta, told me his story. In 1990, Savanta was a captain in the Cambodian army, fighting against the Pol Pot regime. His dream was to become a general. All that changed when he stepped on a landmine, a very powerful landmine that blew off both of his legs, sent shrapnel into his hands and into his face. He spent eight months in a hospital. And when he was released, his only option to provide for his family was to become a beggar. After a while, I told Savanta, I said, Brother, I've got this weird idea to get rid of these landmines. And he was so happy to hear that. I repeat, he was so happy to hear that. Two years later, I presented this to him. A machine cobbled together for my dad's little farm tractors, ready for testing in the mine. I called it the peace hand. When I come back to America, I am so thankful to be in this wonderfully blessed country. And I can't wait to give speeches at Toastmasters. 
Over the years, I've given dozens of speeches. And one day, I received an email from Toastmaster magazine asking if they could do an article regarding the peace hammer. Well, I'll be honest, being a weird inventor is not so easy. <laughs> but when that magazine came out, wow, that was a game changer. I'd take that magazine to machine shops. They would welcome me in, help in incredible ways. Today, I'm more hopeful than ever because the good people from Toastmasters, some of them right here in this room today, are helping me to improve this invention, become a machine that we believe will save countless lives and limbs, not just in Cambodia, but around the world. Now, do you see why I thank God for Toastmasters? Friends, I believe there's many of us out there with weird ideas to make the world a better place. And I want to encourage you I'd like you to consider being a Toastmaster as being like a battery in your car. Of course, for me, I like to think about tractors. These big, powerful, complex machines have the potential of doing so much good, thousands of times more than I can do myself. Yet, they all rely on a battery to make that spark to get everything working. Of course, a battery needs to be charged up and installed properly, or else it doesn't know. So I'm challenging you, Toastmasters, to get charged up, connect your positive to positive, ground out the negative, <coughs> and be that spark that changes the world.
I'm the only income earner in my family. I have two young girls who wait, nine and seven years old. How? How? I was so absorbed by that thought. Suddenly, I realized the car was not moving even by an inch. It ended up in a pile of snow. Yes, 911. Towing company. But this darn phone ran out of battery. You know what? Murphy's law always finds the best time to take action. <laughs> I came out of the car, waiting for help in this freezing cold weather. About five to ten minutes later, a car stopped by. A senior gentleman came to my help. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Can I use your phone to call the towing company? Relax, relax, young man. Let's see what we can do. He went into the car, and then I saw the car moving back, forth, back, forth, for a few times. And then he was able to back the car off the smoke. Okay, young man, now you can save a few hundred bucks. But you're not so stressed out. What's going on? Oh, thank you so much, sir. Well, it's hard to say. I, I just lost my job today. It's the first time in my life. Okay, I see, I see. Young man, tell you what? I'm 69 years old. Over my career of more than 40 years, I lost a job maybe five or six times. But each time, I found something new and I like it better. I'm sure this will be true for you also. Wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I thank you and continue my journey. But then, another earth shaking thought popped up. The company I work for scheduled for a Christmas party for employees and family this coming weekend. How could I tell my two young daughters we couldn't go anymore? How? How? With that thought, I arrived home. My two young daughters greeted me at the door. It took me quite some effort to sweep out a bitter smile on my face. Honey, what a nice day for a snowball and a snowman game. Let's go for that. My younger daughter said, Daddy, Daddy, I'm ready for the Christmas party. I want to have dinner with Santa. Oh, you know, honey, Daddy just got to a very important business meeting this coming week. We couldn't go to the party. My older daughter looked at me through my eye. Daddy, I know why we could not go. Mom told me everything. I almost collapsed. My wife came over. Henry, nothing is better than truth for a mentally healthy and a strong kid. We're all through this together. Tears what up. I cried. The whole family embraced each other and we prayed for a few minutes. That has become my most memorable moment in my lifetime so far. I started job searching and career transition. <coughs> Five years ago, job market was tough. Whenever a little position was posted, up and against pile up. As if football players pile up for a ball. <laughs> <laughs> the difference is maybe 5, 10, or 20 players, but hundred or thousands of them job seekers. Well, long story short, I did not find a job but ended up to be a co-owner of a business. Of course, the first few years were rough and tough because all of my training were about engineering. To be a business owner, it demands well a long expertise. Over the last few years, I developed a new skill and the business has gained traction. Right now, it's running healthy and solid. At this moment, I really appreciate what the senior gentleman did to me five years ago. When he showed me how to back the car off the snow, he also taught me a life lesson. Life is not a straightforward path. Sometimes you get hurdled and you need to back off and find your rock again. Today, I'm a much 
happier to be a business owner than a corporation employee. And my happiness is not due to pleasure, but due to victory. When I overcome hurdles on my journey to pursue a passionate life and career. Come on, sir.
contestants, and I want the table topic contestants to come up first in the order that they came in for their contest contest. Come on down. Gina, Jeff, Joe, Rose, Cynthia, and Mary.
So if I've passed on my enthusiasm for chess to somebody, that's been good. And I noticed you said you're inspired, you're inspired, you inspire your daughters and your new granddaughter. Four months old. Because he started his own business 
When he was in the first year of college, he runs an eBay business, and he is truly an entrepreneur, and he also started on his path of personal development, self-improvement, self-growth. And my daughter, she's just a young professional, dynamic young woman who I love dearly, and so I learned from both of them. It's kind of like the yin and the yang. It's all good. Though. So those are your self -help. Absolutely. Well, Dave, thank you for coming, and there's a good participation
And I'm today I'm representing Toastmasters Plus Club Sponsor 77.
announce the winners and see you progress on to the district level. A couple of things really quickly. I'd like to thank everyone who was a functionary today, whether you were a judge, a ballot counter, a timer, a contestant, or even if you just came out and supported our contestants, I greatly appreciate you being here and making our contest what it is. So give yourselves a round of applause.